<laughs> I'm like, come on, market oh yourselves. Right. All right. Yeah, make a living. I think we're live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how we are. Make a I think we're live. Exactly. Hello. Hello, booksellers. How is the, uh, how's how's the Winter Institute going? Yeah. Wellness, wellness check on booksellers. Is that what you um, <laughs> My name is Anton Bogomazov. I am the adult book buyer uh, at Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it is my immense pleasure to moderate a panel called Beyond the Binary uh, with Maysoon Zaid, Miranda July, Danzi Senna, and Ladarian Williams. So please welcome them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I am hoping to discuss how contemporary fiction sort of invites the reader to see categories that we would normally see as binary, as more fluid um, and less sort of set. I think those of you who were here in the morning and heard Michelle, William, uh, Michelle Norris talk about kind of characters of people who do not fit in one box. So I'm hoping that we will cover some of that. And um, we sort of try to ask our panelists what their experience writing such characters are. Um, so I think I'm gonna start with asking all of you to sort of briefly introduce yourselves to booksellers and tell us what your new book is about. And sort of, this is a room of booksellers and they're gonna be enthusiastically selling your books when they're out. Um, so if you sort of put our, yourselves in our place and if you're talking to a customer, what would you tell them about your book and sort of what it is and why they should read it? So I, we can just... I'm going to throw it to Ladarian. I don't okay. want to we can, we can I'm, This is like my wow. first time at the like bookseller. I have to hear how everyone else pitches themselves. But just really quickly, I'm not sure why I'm on this panel because all of my characters are cisgendered, able-bodied, and straight. So, I mean, just, no, <laughs> Ladarian. Yeah, I guess Ladarian, you first. <laughs> I guess me first. Uh, yeah, so I'm Ladarian Williams. I am the author of the upcoming YA debut, Blood at the Root. Um, <laughs> uh, my book is about uh, a black kid named Malik Barron who gets accepted into a magical HBCU and he must go there to learn about his ancestral magic. Mm. But also he f discovers that his mom went there and she's been missing for quite some time and now he has to investigate some people there because they had something to do with it. Um, and yeah, this is my debut year. It's a YA contemporary fantasy and it comes out May 7th. Congratulations, <laughs> yes. Oh, my job. Hi, I'm Danzi Senna, and um, my novel that's coming out in July is called Colored Television, and it's a dark comedy about a novelist um, who is flailing in the, at Los Angeles and um, has written this 10-year uh, opus that her husband calls the mulatto war and peace, and she... Uh, <laughs> sort of flops with it, nobody wants it, so she decides to try her hand in Hollywood and gets caught up with this uh, network mogul who wants to make the greatest biracial comedy of all time. And of course, there is no other biracial comedy, so um, the standards are very low. But it um, is about her identity as an artist, her marriage, her children, and her attempt to kind of um, market her identity, sort of exploit herself mm. for Hollywood mm. gains and the kind of rise and fall <laughs> of that situation. And it's my sixth book, and um, I've really been writing about the multiracial experience in America for a very long time. I feel like a, a dinosaur in some ways. And um, so that's kind of, um, I think, the first place I enter the, the question of the non-binary is the racial non-binary. Mm. Well, that's good. Good book. Um, uh, my name's Miranda July, and my book is called All Fours. And um, I guess I was thinking about, I was feeling the fact that as a woman, there's a lot of engagement with, with your journey as a young woman and as a, a woman who can reproduce and a lot of kind of over-involvement in your body. And then that abruptly stops. 
at middle age, um, I actually turn 50 in two days. Mm. Um, oh, and uh, <laughs> let's all sing to me. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, don't do that. Um, uh, and so there's this kind of, um, like, just imagine, if you will, be, you know, imaginative and imagine all the information stopped. I'm kidding. I feel like some of you know this. Um, and the path up ahead isn't really all that written and what there is is very narrow that you might conceive of yourself in this this kind of narrow second half of your life and so this woman my character she um she uh she sets out on a on a road trip but she doesn't she you know says bye to her husband and child and is going to drive across the country the u.s um but she stops 30 minutes away from her house and checks into a motel and is secretly there um, <laughs> having a kind of different sort of journey. Um, and uh, yeah, and it, it, it's, it's funny, um, dirty, as you would say. <laughs> um, I'm and, spicy. Uh, spicy. <laughs> spicy is the word, I think. I heard you say d yeah. dirty, and we agreed we like that word. We like dirty. the word dirty. Yeah. 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 We hope to be dirty. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, so, so glad to be here with all of you. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Mason Zayed, and I'm a comedian disability advocate, Princeton Fellow, and I have five other jobs because it's really expensive being disabled in America. And I'm the author of Shiny Misfits. It's considered a middle grade book, but it's for all, it's literally for all ages. I'm an old school comic book fan who wrote a graphic novel, had to call it a graphic novel, but it's a comic book. But like, we'll call it a graphic novel because that's what parents want. And the central character is disabled. She has cerebral palsy, which is what I have. Um, but often when you see any literature about disabled people, whether it's children or adults, it's usually not written by the disabled person. And especially when we get into kids lit, it tends to be the parent lens which can be really dangerous for kids instead of like, you know, the social disabled um, lens. So Shiny Misfits is very serious. There's nothing funny about it. No, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a comedic romp about a girl with cerebral palsy who I wanted to write a book about misfits because I'm a misfit, right? I'm Palestinian, I'm Muslim, I'm a woman of color, I'm divorced, I'm disabled, I'm from New Jersey. I am a misfit. <laughs> And the tagline on the book is you can fit in or you can stand out. And the idea of Shiny Misfits was, why is it that whenever we see these disabled characters, the people that are friends with them, they either do it because it's like they're volunteering for the Girl Scouts patch or their parents like promise them something, but no one actually wants to be friends with the kids. And I wanted to write a character who like me, you either want to be my best friend or you're terrified of me. Mm. <laughs> but where Shiny Misfits really fits in to the idea of beyond binary is people think that if you're disabled, that's all you are. Yeah. And what I say is the disco, which is the disability community, intersects with every single other community, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about poverty. We're talking about invisible disabilities like autism, diabetes, neurodivergence. We're talking about race, and we're talking about queerness. Um, but, and I'm getting like a little, huh? Because uh, I have CP, so like I shake all the time. I shake it like Taylor Swift, and I just need the billionaire um, income. So if we could work on that. But, um, I think the most important thing about Shiny Misfits in this moment in time is that I chose to write a book with no borders. Mm -hmm. So while a lot of people like to say the character is Arab American, she's not. Mm -hmm. um, there's no borders. There's no borders in this book. So instead of referring to race like Arab or Latino or African, we went back to the First Nations mm -hmm. and we did elements like rose gold, mahogany, Mm -hmm. Sand, and I'm I'm shaking because I know that like I don't want to take any space from my other authors, but I'm a Palestinian author mm -hmm. writing a children's book 
in a world where at least 10,000 children have been killed in the last four months. And I feel like what Shiny Misfits does is it strips away all of those divisions mm -hmm. without taking away the culture, the race, the color. We can't just make everybody the same color to make them equal. But like as a Palestinian author, I am telling everyone in this room, we are being silenced, we're being pulled off of shelves. And I think Shiny Misfits is a book that can save lives and that can get parents who are pining for a perfect kid to accept the misfit they have instead and celebrate that. So. Absolutely. Please, and yeah. I will, this is the last thing. Stop the genocide, cease fire now. Use your words. Thank you. No, it's, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. And you wrote a middle grade graphic novel, but I actually think that it sort of relates to um, Denzi's work. Um, because you also, your work is known for, um, Denzi, your work is known for like its examination of racial and cultural identity. So in this new book, is there something different that from the previous novels? Like how, how do you, did you write sort of um, this particular one? Well, it's, it's you know, when I, I started writing in the 90s about characters who resembled my own world. I'm half black and half white and have um, grown up in a time when those families, people like me, really were not anywhere represented. And so um, I had to write into a kind of void of um, like these people who have existed since the you know beginning of this country and um, through very you know dark and disturbing ways that people like me came to be, but um, have continued to exist but been called by different names. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think my work is all connected. My body of work is all connected in that it sort of writes this reality into existence, but comes at it from very different angles. And um, I really am sort of in this book really embracing the sort of comedy of multiracialness. And, the, and for me, comedy is um, only interesting when it's undercut by rage and sadness. <laughs> um, yep. And you know, I love what you're saying, yep. Maysoon, because it really feels like in kinship with what I'm thinking about. And I'm really, um, in terms of this question of the non-binary, um, I'm, I'm not interested in neutrality, like non-binary as neutral, and I've always identified as a black woman of multiracial descent, a black woman with a white mother. Um, and so I came from a place of thinking of, of the non-binary actually as a kind of um, more politicized and less just identity-based thing, but actually as, you know, thinking of like Howard Zinn and um, there's no, you know, you can't be neutral on a moving train and right. thinking about how no, the non-binary can be there to interrogate sort of systems of power mm -hmm. and um, as a kind of lens to see the world that doesn't divide mm -hmm. who's worthy of existing exactly. and who isn't. Um, mm -hmm. But I think this, this book for me is the most... Um, probably like bingeable comedic story. Mm. Um, but I it hope really that is. like some of the, the rage that's underneath it about sort of bringing an identity into existence. Right. Would you there. prefer the word, I don't know, intersectionality maybe or something? No, I don't even no, mind yeah, the word. Yeah. I, just, I just yeah. don't feel yeah. um, like identity politics mm -hmm. are less interesting to me maybe at this point in my right. life than um, questions of, of money and power and, and bodies and what happens mm -hmm. to people in the world when they're read a particular way. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I want to switch things up a little bit and talk to Miranda and Larian about things that we normally don't consider to be binary to begin with. So maybe like time in your life or like where you are in your life or even your relationships. So Miranda, I think one of the calls we had, you said something like marriage is a non-binary thing. Oh. So I don't know if you want yeah. to maybe talk about how you would see 
like well, I, yeah. continu continuum of like relationships and maybe sexuality or identity. Is this going to be my one shot? No, 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 absolutely not. No, no, no. Because no, no, no. I can talk about that, but not if I'm not going to talk again. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I you can talk again. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, I think there were a couple of things I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them was I was sort of musing because there is a non binary child in the book, like my mm -hmm. child. There's a bisexual one like mine, but those, you know, kind of as you said, like we know about mm -hmm. that understanding of it. And there were two other things that maybe are less thought of that way. One was marriage um, as something you usually think, well, you're, you're married or you're not, mm. right? You're married or you're mm. divorced. And I, mm -hmm. I guess I was like, well, since the whole invention of marriage is, is, you know, is based on things that don't really exist so much in our lives mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, like the the farm and, and a certain kind of shared labor and property. And I mean, right. granted, that's all still there, <laughs> shared labor <laughs> and property. But I mean, the structure, I think we're generally trying to undo those structures, but not marriage. I mean, marriage holds. And I guess in this book, I try and explore like, what if, what if we made it more like what we wanted, you know, mm -hmm. and, and particularly, um, for a woman, like, what if you, you actually, like, it feels so illegal to actually just sit and think. I mean, when I was first writing the book, I just, you know, I'd meet with my friend every week and we would just say, like, if we could have things be how we really wanted them to be. And we felt like such criminals and sluts and, uh, you know, and it, 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 it just seemed like, well, but wait, you know, we're, we're, it's accepted that we're radical and as thinkers, as as writers, as artists, mm -hmm. you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's so strange that in this one area we feel we need to conform just to do the thing, you know, mm -hmm. just to have the thing at all, just and to be a mother, you know? Um, and so this book, you know, is, was part of a process of, of just letting something fall apart that maybe didn't need to be held together in that way to hold love well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, Darren, you have a high school student who is essentially also a college student. Mm -hmm. So how, like, how does the writing this character sort of felt for you? Yeah, um, you know, writing Malik, I, I, I'm thinking about the 17-year-old Ladarian um, who, you know, from where I'm from, a lot of times black kids just have their innocence stolen from them. Mm -hmm a lot of times and it's and growing up and growing up the way I did um you know I didn't get to be a kid you know sometimes and and it felt like like it felt criminal like to even you know think about kid things and and and, and not worrying about like finances like you know because I, I I lived with a single mother and and worrying about not having this or that and so um I wrote Malik because college is such a a, a when you, when you, I guess when you graduate high school, it's such a, um, a moment uh, where, you know, you're used to going to school. Like for me, I, I was used to getting up at a certain time, mm -hmm. going, getting on the bus, going to class, talking with friends, you know, joking, cracking jokes mm -hmm. with them and going home and, and having a job and, and then going to bed and then redoing it all over again. But I, I also don't think we talk about a lot where when you graduate, that is stripped away from you. And what, like, what do you do now? Like, you, <laughs> yeah. you know, they tell you, like, learn, learn, learn. And then when, when high school goes away, real life problems set in. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like sometimes high school don't teach you about like, real life oh, problems. Of course. Um, and so Malik deals with, you know, grief. He deals with um, having his childhood stolen from him. He's, and also being, that being replaced with magic. He has this certain thing about himself that he doesn't know where it came from, where, who he's connected to. And also just, you know, in my time of life, you know, just being a black man in America, like I don't know where my ancestors came from. And mm -hmm. I don't feel connected a lot of times to um, just my history and, 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 and seeing that my family, like older people just kind of like dying off and, mm -hmm. and we're losing that history. Like we, I don't, you know, we don't collect photos, we don't collect stories. And so it's important for me, for Malik, to kind of 
graduate from one part of his life, which is high school, and to go into college, but also literally learning about his ancestry right. and to mm -hmm. figure out that he doesn't have to be one thing. Right. Um, and yeah, and you know, and obviously for me, like when I see a lot of black boy characters being written, they're always either playing basketball or football and they have to choose that or sometimes to be a drug dealer, to get their mom out of, mm -hmm. you know, poverty. And it's like, no, he's not, that's not what he's reduced to. <laughs> right. He's literally learning about his ancestry. And so, and, and with that, he's learning, you know, about, he, when he goes to college, he's opened up to a whole new world of, pun intended, like, you know, Aladdin. <laughs> that <song popped laughs> in my head. Um, but he's literally opened up to a whole new world about, you know, he is introduced to a non-binary character and also a bisexual character. His roommate is going to be mm -hmm. a bisexual black man from Alabama. And he's telling him, look, you know, as a black man who dibble and dabble in, in both, you don't have to be one thing too. And he's going to learn that over the course of Blood at the Root and book two and book three and oh. hopefully more. So yeah. And he has magic powers. So. And, and the and magic powers, powers. yeah. yeah. Um, Anton, it's so interesting to be on a panel called Beyond Binary mm -hmm. and talking to booksellers because when they see books like our books, mm -hmm. they do try to pigeonhole it. Not, not anyone in this room, you're all cutting edge, right? <laughs> but like, you know, as a, I'm, I'm a public speaker and I do stand up comedy. So like when I market myself, I'll be like, oh, women and Islam and comedy and this. And what I saw with Shiny Misfits, mm -hmm. they were like, it's a disabled book. Mm -hmm. I'm like, but it's also about race. It's also about mm -hmm. friendship. It's also about health. Mm -hmm. It's also about, so it's interesting to be in this room and watch the challenge of how do you showcase our books when it doesn't fall into this very obvious. That was actually yeah. my next question. Oh. Yeah. No, you're good. You're oh great. Gosh, so no, 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 no. You, you, Why don't we switch seats? Let's just do it. It's not a no, binary thing. We are both Yeah. Close. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> This yeah. is actually perfect segue because I did want to say we are in a room full of booksellers mm -hmm. and we do sell books and um, sort of try to, um, I wanted to ask you like what your thoughts were on selling of identities or marketing your book. Like if you feel constrained or maybe you want something to change or do something. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to see people actually consult the communities that mm -hmm. they're representing, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're doing this great, like, disabled thing for Disability Awareness Month and a bookstore that's all bookshelves and, like, a wheelchair can't even pass through your stacks, you're probably not doing it right. And I know that there are challenges, and I know that everything is financially challenging, and so I think it's really important to not be shy about reaching out to the communities that you're trying to represent and saying, like, how do we get in black kids who never thought of coming into this store? How do we reach out to a non- verbal community that just eats up these books that we don't know how to communicate in the traditional ways with. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important when you're marking these things to really look beyond like that box of like, where could I put a book in two separate sections? Mm -hmm. Can it be here and there? Like we've seen that. But I think the key is consult the community. You can't read every single book, I understand that. So then lean on the community and say, who can we consult to make this better? And if you can't find anyone else, reach out to the authors. Other than me, these people are bored. They're just pretending <laughs> to have writer's block for hours on end, they will answer your call. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know, um, for me, I asked, you know, I've been asking, because Blood at the Root actually started off as a TV show, and, you know, Hollywood is going to Hollywood. Because, but I was asking a lot of the tough questions, because, you know, when I was in high school, literally, like, Twilight was taking off, Divergent, Hunger Games, like, that was, like, the YA boom, right? But being a black boy from Alabama with a country twang, like, I didn't see, you know, myself in Percy Jackson, or I love those books, don't get me wrong, but I didn't see myself in them, and so now, as... I, I was writing Blood at the Root. I was asking the tough questions. Where are the black boys at that doesn't deal with police brutality and are getting mm. literally murdered? Every, mm -hmm. And those stories are important, don't get me wrong, but we got to let we got to let black boys live in books because I have a nephew and and I want him to grow up and say, like, wow, look, that boy looks like me. 
and he gets to live and he gets to fall in love and he gets to have adventures. So, you know, so that's, that's, that's the mission that I'm on. And, 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 and if sometimes it feels lonely to talk about it, but you know, I'm, I'm going to keep asking those questions and I, I want to ask book, booksellers and, and other, you know, other people that, you know, that are interested in books and, and, and seeing now that people like I'm, I'm on social media, like TikTok and Twitter. And like, when I, when I talk about that, they're like, I didn't, I didn't think so. I didn't think about that. And it's like, that's a really cool privilege to have. Mm-hmm. When you don't have right. to think about that. Because, yeah. But I do. I still, I still think about, I don't, I don't want to see my black boy character go through that mm-hmm. and, and, be, and literally be killed to teach racism. Mm-hmm. No, that's not what his life is. Yeah. That's not what his life is about. No, he's going to, this black boy is going to learn his magic. He's going to <laughs> fall in love. He's going to have adventures. He's going to mess up. He's going to make mistakes. But those mistakes are not going to cost him his life to teach. Right readers about racism, so. And we're not exaggerating at all about how much these, like, what are considered out of the box or risky books Mm -hmm. are, like, people are terrified of these books. Schools are afraid to carry a book that has a Muslim character Mm -hmm. or a non-traditional character, or they'll hide behind the idea of, like, something complicated like Danzy that discusses race. They're like, well, we can't put that book here. How are we? So we really are dealing with a time of censorship. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think we've seen since, like, McCarthyism with books. And the responsibility in this room to take the risks on the books that everyone tells you, nobody's going to buy this. It's too niche. We're not niche. You know why we're not niche? Because it's good. The writing is good. Outside of our identities, these are top-notch books because we all have to work so much harder than the average Joe. And by that, I mean literally a guy named Joe. He's (laughs) mediocre, and he gets everything that we have to struggle for. Danzy, do you have... Yeah, I mean... This is your sixth book. Yeah, it's my sixth book. And, and, you know, um, when I wrote Caucasia, my first book, it was like uh, literally there was no representations of multiracial black white characters that were not tragic and did not end up dying at the end mm. um mm-hmm. the, the tragic mulatto was what i was writing against and um mm. and have continued to try to write sort of um the full complexity and human experience of characters of mixed race that like you were saying you know we aren't just there as like a symbol for Martin Luther King Day, like our life is more, and we're fucked, you know, sorry, we're messed up and we're... Um, <laughs> no, they have adult books, you can say fuck. Okay, they're fucked okay. up. <laughs> and, and speaking of the non-binary, like these, the woman in my book and the last many books I've written, like they are, it's not clear, you know, whether they're on the right side all the time and they're, they're kind of um, morally non-binary. Mm-hmm. Like I'm really interested in characters who are making mistakes and who are um, often, you know, it's not clear who's the victim, who's the oppressor, who's yeah. exploiting who. Um, and so I'm, uh, one of the, you know, best compliments I had as a writer and, you know, one of my other books came out and someone came to my reading, a mixed race woman, and said, um, reading your work was the first time I realized being biracial was, its, was a race and that it was a thing in and of mm. itself. Mm-hmm. And thank you for like writing mm-hmm. our, our you know, selves into existence. And so um, I continued to do that in many different ways, but as you, you know, talked about so well, like this isn't a character who's betwixt and between mm-hmm. and whose life is like, about am I black or am I white? She's mm-hmm. trying to like figure out how to get rich in Hollywood. <laughs> oh, it's a different situation, different set of problems. Yeah. Um, Miranda, I think if you want to follow this up, because your character, I think, is also a woman kind of, I don't know, between two times in her life and she also is maybe making some mistakes or? No, think? she's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Yeah, I mean, you know, I started writing this book when I was about 45, and I remember I was having conversations with other women, really smart, some of the smarter women I think there are, and we all were super dumb about what was happening with our bodies. Mm. Um, And we were dumb because our doctors were dumb. 
Um, they, they, didn't, they hadn't actually been trained. Um, they hadn't been taught about perimenopause or menopause, um, and, but we were in, we were well in perimenopause. I mean, frankly, in your late 30s, you know, you, you might not be thinking about that, but you, it's already started. And, uh, and so, and it's, it's a huge, you know, hormones regulate. So they regulate your emotions and everything in your body. So if you're, you're feeling, you know, a little funny, you, you maybe don't have to. Like maybe the way science has supported other aspects, it could also support women, <laughs> this, this, um, <laughs> this little niche group. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I initially just started researching, researching, um, uh, stuff that weirdly, near the end of when I was writing my book, suddenly there was like a front cover New York Times Magazine article called Women Have Been Misled About Menopause. Um, and I was kind of like, whoa, I'm really glad I took a left turn there and decided not to make my whole book about breaking that story that a real journalist <laughs> could break. And instead, um, at a certain point when I was all filled up with all the facts, I thought, oh, well, I'm a novelist, actually, and a fiction writer. I can, um, I can have this woman get it kind of wrong, because usually you do. Like, you look, you look at these things through your own lens. All she cares about is that her libido is dropping. And maybe there's some stuff she wants to do before that happens, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and is it really? Is that the facts? You know, like I'm not, but, but that wasn't my job, you know? Um, what is libido? Like, how is it? Isn't it? Okay. Anyways. Um, uh, and so it became really, really exciting when I realized like, oh, it's, it's this fun house mirror look at something that is biological, but... Um, and, and that's the best way to look at it because not one of you will get it right and also not one of you will have the same experience as or has had the same experience as another woman. So it, in a way, that's the hardest thing for uh, medicine to deal with. You know, that's why men, and they're, they're a little more, I mean, they're all different, but they're a little more orderly with, you know, their, their bodies, and it's, it's, that's why you can't test anything on women, so hmm. you just do it on men, and then you, <laughs> you give it to women, and if it doesn't work, you don't know why, and it doesn't matter. Um, so um, anyway, so the novel takes you through that territory, um, and it is, I, I think perimenopause just is non-binary because it's a transitional time, mm. um, but it's, it's like a decade. You know, so it'd be a kind of a weird thing not to think about it. To, yeah. to you know, my mom said it was no big deal, um, <laughs> but I guess I think maybe it should be a big deal, um, and in a kind of um, almost like spiritual, biblical, like it it mm. it could be um, really significant for who you're trying to become. Mm. And I think it's so important to know that. When you're dealing with books like these books, we can only tell one story, right? So you're telling one black man's story, I'm telling one disabled or Muslim or extraordinarily Kardashian looking Jersey girl's story. And I think that the pressure on us is to represent the whole community. So like, I read all my reviews, you're not supposed to read them, I read them, I sit up, I. I talk to Esther in the reviews, we, we, we chat. And people are so disappointed that I refuse to explain the disability of the character. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we don't understand this cerebral palsy. Why won't she give us a medical definition? And I'm like, look yeah. it up. Yeah. So yeah, like, no. it's also not our job to represent every single aspect of the community or to apologize about the fact that you don't understand every single inside joke. Some of the jokes are not for you. Like my book has 148 Easter eggs, 23 of them. Only people who grew up with me on the Jersey Shore are gonna understand, like that's the reality. Not everything is for everybody, but I dislike when people would ask me, and this was never my extraordinary publisher, Scholastic, because let me tell you, the patients imagine working with me. But when they would ask, 
me, not my editors, but other people. Is this a book for disabled kids or for non-disabled kids? And I was like, it's a book for everyone. Why do you think that we can only write for our culture? Why, when we've defaulted to having like 98.999% of the characters be visibly able-bodied, do we not get the chance to tell stories to you? We listen to your stories. It's your turn to listen to ours. And that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why we say it's got to be quality first, right? Yeah. Because it's like, this is a book for everyone, not because everyone can find themselves in it, but because the themes of, like you said, parents who fail, friendships, school, uh, donuts on fire and a talking cat. These are all <laughs> things that we can personally identify with. <laughs> yeah, talking cat. You have a talking cat, right? Absolutely, yeah. Have you um, talked to them? Because nonverbal cats exist and they deserve respect. <laughs> <laughs> with, with that actually, um, we have about oh, seven minutes left. So what I wanted to sort of conclude it with is sort of a wish list of sorts. <laughs> like, I want Taylor Swift yeah. tickets in Madrid. <laughs> oh, um, sorry. <laughs> I mean, yes. Uh, but in books or in publishing, like, do you have something you want to see more of? You know? yeah. I, I, I'll, every time I see my book cover and I, I share it and, and talk with people about it, um, I just remember me going, I'm, I live in LA, and I remember me going to the Burbank, uh, like a Burbank bookstore, like Barnes & Noble, and, um, I, and I was just trying to get back into reading, because I stopped reading for years, because I just got tired. And, I, and I, I asked the lady, I was like, hey, I'm just looking for books with black boys on the cover. Mm -hmm. um, and she took me to the YA section, she looked up and down, I looked up and down. We found one, but again, it was dealing with police brutality. I was like, and this was during the riots. Like this was during like the civil war. So I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. Um, and she kept looking up and down. I kept looking up and down. And I was just like, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. So imagine like a 17 year old kid now, a black boy from Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, or New York, wherever. And they like, they just want to see themselves, you know, represented in YA fantasy. Mm -hmm. Like, why can't they just be on the book? So I wish that I want to see a bookshelf full of <laughs> black boys on them and they're in power and glory and they're doing cool stuff. Like that's, that's my wish, you know, <laughs> for the publishing industry. Um, I think, you know, I'm always interested in there, but there are a lot of um, complex, you know, funny, idiosyncratic black family dramas and black and biracial family dramas that was, you know, one of the things I wanted to write about a family like the one in my book, um, where they're both black creative artists who don't have a lot of money and are trying to raise children in a very expensive city and be, continue to make art. Um, but I'm also interested in um, more comedy in fiction about race and identity um, and, you know, I guess just like putting out there that comic literature is some of the hardest things to write. I mean, I'm a professor yeah, I and agree. I teach creative writing and it's, it's really hard to write a comic novel and it's very serious business. <laughs> and like, it's very, um, to me, like comedy is like up here is one of the highest tones to reach and it hits every other emotional state and irony being such an important non-binary quality right. in work. Um, so just to kind of see more of that mm -hmm. um, and allowing for that and seeing that is very, very um, important as a kind of voice we need mm -hmm. in these very serious yeah. times. They can speak to these times. Miranda, do you have a... Yeah, we were talking about that. Um, yeah, it's funny. I... Um, I look out at this audience and I actually, for once in my life, feel like you guys are just going to do a great job <laughs> of this, this particular, but I don't always feel that way, but I feel like um, uh, I feel like the power holders in this world are um, 
are just right. I don't. I don't know. I just. I just feel like um, these. You guys are. I'm seeing a lot of women. Seeing women who are not young. They're not identified by their youth in in a way that I think is really exciting. You know, like women who know stuff and who run businesses and uh, make it work. And that's um, not easy with a with a bookstore. And so I. I guess I just. Um, I don't, I'm, I second all the things you're saying, but I, I, um, I, I also sometimes make movies and that's a very, I don't have that feeling. It is truly so male dominated and I'm always trying to come up with a thing to say that's gonna make them comfortable enough to sell me. <laughs> um, that, so I'm not like icky or something. Um, and, uh, and I guess I just, I'm just noting that, so. Um, uh, I You're feel like you've got my back. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, and that means a lot because actually the whole time I was writing, I, I was like, I'm pretty, sh this could go very badly. <laughs> and like, I could just do this whole transition and people could think I'm young for quite a while and it could, that could be more graceful, but I wasn't sure what the, what the huge reward was of doing that. Like maybe I would get ignored less meanly Mm. Um, <laughs> if I didn't make a big deal out of it. So I, I guess I felt like I'll take my chances and it's on you, you know, um, that I did that and I, I feel hopeful. I know some of you so. have already read it so, and, and are excited to sell it. So yes. okay. absolutely. May soon you want to oh, fin finish? Oh, I have so much. Yeah, my wish list is, <laughs> yeah. my wish list is longer. I have so much less faith in you all than my <laughs> Miranda does. So I'll start with the wish list of having all the events that you do and the outreach that you do virtually be accessible. So like Shiny Misfits, our audio book is coming out the exact same day as our print book to make it, thank you, to make it accessible to blind students, to kids who have intellectual disabilities, to people who just like having something read to them, and to people who want to hear Dave Matthews be the cat's voice, because he is. <laughs> so that wish came true already, alhamdulillah. But what I would say is I'll, I'll just circle back my wish list to the beginning. You have to amplify authentic voices because with great power comes great responsibility. And the reality is this room isn't as diverse as it could be, so you have a lot of power to amplify voices that aren't um, your own. And I would start with saying this year, especially 2024, I want you to look for Palestinian voices to amplify. We are not just being censored and silenced. We have entire families being wiped off the registry. Their stories will be gone forever if we don't tell those stories. So please, get Shiny Misfits, of course, that's first. Get that book, get their book, and then look around and amplify the voices who are being silenced. All of the voices that are being silenced in this nation right now, it's a lot, it's a heavy lift, but the quality is there and it is your job to rage, rage, rage against the dying of the light and amplify our voices. Thank you. Thank you. Leave me Palestine. Equality. Thank Equality for all children, regardless of faith. Thank you all so much uh, for being here and for such a great conversation. Thank you, all booksellers. I hope you enjoyed the rest of your Winter Institute. We're going to be signing books. <laughs> Thank you, Anton. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you.